Rachel Hewitt. I'm the Older Adult Care Coordinator at St. Mary's County Health Department, LBHA. And while I am representing the Health Department today, some of the material you'll see on these slides are from my experience in EMS. We're gonna be talking about substance misuse and mental health for seniors. Some things to think about regarding your prescription medications, health literacy, mental health in the senior community, and then I'm gonna be going over some health department programs. And then at the end, I will give you some resources regarding substance misuse and mental health. All right, let's start with substance misuse. Substance use among the elderly community is a growing health issue in the United States. Substance misuse includes prescription medications, illicit drug use, and alcohol. Alcohol and drug misuse can contribute to or complicate your health problems, or you have an increased risk for strokes or seizures. Some of these other health problems might be high blood pressure or diabetes. Sometimes alcohol and drug misuse can mimic medical symptoms such as dementia, depression, or diabetes. So some, maybe your doctor thinks that your dementia or your memory issues are because you're getting older, but in reality, it could be a drug or alcohol misuse. Here are some 2018 statistics. Notice that it is 2018. The CDC, SAM HSA, and other government websites have not updated their information regarding substance use and the older population post COVID. Speaking of COVID, COVID definitely caused some health issues in the older adult population, not just because of the vaccines or the virus, but many seniors were isolated from friends, families, and normal routines. Some seniors physically aged more due to lack of exercise when certain facilities started shutting down things. For instance, my grandmother was in a sort of assisted living type situation and they closed the group activities. She wasn't able to go outside as much and she was able to ambulate on her own. And now because of COVID and things being shut down, she now uses a walker. All of these things took a toll on mental health in seniors, and it could have contributed to a higher rate of substance misuse. One of the substances is alcohol. Alcohol causes harmful and lasting effects on the brain. It can lead to a decline in your cognitive function and in your memory. As we age, the body's ability to break down alcohol decreases. So maybe you think you're out at dinner and you're one of those people that thinks having one or two beers or one or two glasses of wine um, is okay because you're eating. As you age, the body's ability to break that down decreases. So you're at increased risk for having a car accident or another kind of incident. Under 25 years old is the leading age of car crashes, but over 65 years old is the second leading age of car crashes. So just something you're thinking about as you age and consume alcohol. When you combine prescription medication with alcohol, it can also have lasting effects on your health. It has increased drug toxicity, or it can reduce your medication concentration, which in turn has other health effects because the prescriptions are trying to combat your medical conditions. And then alcohol contributes to anxiety symptoms, and we'll go over anxiety later. So why do some seniors misuse substances? We all know as we get older, it gets more difficult. We'll have more chronic pain, new health issues arise, but also as we get older, we lose some of our friends and loved ones and that alone is hard. Sometimes um, we have depression and loneliness. So mental health can be a trigger for substance misuse. And here are some signs that someone is misusing substances. Changes in eating habits, failing to take care of themselves, unexplained bruises, any kind of irregular pattern in their daily lives. So what can you do to help your senior if you suspect that they're, uh, they're misusing substances? Ask open-ended questions such as, how much alcohol do you typically drink in a, in a week? How often are you taking other drugs? Make sure you're not being too judgmental and you're coming from a place of love and concern and empathy. Um, seniors might also misuse substances because they have a lack of social support. Social support is huge for the senior community. So help them have access to their medical needs, to getting those social supports. Have them access community resources. 
And then group therapy is actually really helpful for people who are mis misusing substances. Moving on to prescriptions, just some things to think about. So prescriptions are considered a substance that can be misused. Benzodiazepines are some of the most dangerous prescriptions if you're not prescribed them. Opioids are the second most commonly reported substance misused by seniors. Some of the reasons why seniors might misuse their prescriptions are due to chronic pain or chronic health issues. Some seniors might take a plethora of prescriptions. You take so many medications that it can be an issue. This is called polypharmacy, and it's a growing issue in the elderly community. The reason that we might have so many prescriptions is because we're a nation of damage control. Some physicians might see a health issue and they treat you with a medication. So you have one pill and then another pill. And then in my experience in EMS, some seniors don't even know why they're taking medications or how many medications they're taking, the names of them. So polypharmacy can be detrimental to your health as well. Another thing to look out for regarding your prescriptions is that some physicians do not confer with each other when they're prescribing them. We all have different kinds of doctors. You might have a cardiologist, your primary care, maybe you have an orthopedist, and all of them are prescribing you different medications. And sometimes they might prescribe you more than one for the same issue. I know that there's things like um, telehealth and there are electronic databases that help with this, but it's important that you keep a list of your medications and you bring it to each provider. It's also important that you review your medications annually with your providers. And if you have any concerns regarding taking too many medications or you have concerns because you're taking an opioid or a benzodiazepine, Make sure you speak with your provider first before you change anything. So smart medicine is the ability to manage your medications, storing them properly and dispose of them properly. Many seniors in the community might babysit for their adult children, or maybe they live with their adult children and they're helping out with their children as well. If you're in this situation, where do you keep your medications? We all know some pills can look like candy and the CBD gummies are becoming popular, and that certainly looks like candy to young children. Teenagers might get into prescription medications as well. So it's important to keep your medications locked up in a safe and secure space. Another important thing is to safely dispose of your medications. Some studies show that if you flush them down the toilet, it might affect our potable water. So if you're concerned about that, the health department does have medication disposal pouches. It has a substance inside. You fill it with your medications and water and it dissolves the medications. And then you can just throw it away. If you are interested in any of that, you can visit the health department or the health hub. We also have medication drop-off locations, medication take-back days, and safe needle disposal at the health department or the health hub. So if say you have diabetes and you use insulin needles or you have a cat that has diabetes even and you don't know what to do with your used syringes and needles, you can safely dispose of them at the health department or the health hub. Moving on to health literacy. What is this? Health literacy is the ability to understand your health and healthcare making important decisions about your health care, making those decisions with your health care providers, and just an overall good feeling about your health. As we get older, we might experience changes in our cognition, our vision, or our hearing that can affect the way that we interpret our health information and make health care decisions. Some seniors with low vision might have trouble reading small print. This can include discharge instructions and medicine bottles. If you tailor websites to seniors, make sure that is easy to read as well. Seniors with low health literacy, meaning you're not able to fully understand what's going on with your health care, are at an incre increased risk for going to the emergency room, for staying at the hospital or being admitted to the hospital. They're sometimes unable to follow treatment plans leading to other health consequences, and you have a higher mort mortality rate. So what can you do to be more involved with your healthcare? Advocate for yourself. 
and ask questions. And if you're afraid to ask questions or you're unable to advocate for yourself, bring a loved one, a caretaker, a family member with you to appointments or if you're being discharged, say from the hospital. Legally, if you're being discharged from the hospital, they're not allowed to discharge you if you still have questions. So if you don't understand something when you're being discharged, you don't understand this medication or why you have this certain health problem all of a sudden, ask questions. They have to answer that for you. Make sure you bring all of your medications to your providers and you renew that annually. Even if it's over the counter, um, a lot of seniors might take over the counter medications, especially herbs and supplements that they think is beneficial for them and that can have counter effects with your prescriptions. If any providers are here today watching this, make sure you're answering those questions. You're coming from a place of patience, empathy, take the time to answer those questions or get them the information that they need. It's really, really important. Make sure you're speaking in plain language so they're understanding what is happening. Um, I know in the medical community, we like using big words sometimes. So hypertension, for example, reduce that down to high blood pressure so it's easier for them to understand and, and remember. Make sure you're making discharge instructions and any printed information easy to read. And then if you're over the phone or using telehealth or any kind of video conferencing, make sure you limit background noise because seniors aren't the only ones who have trouble differentiating the sound in the background. Moving on to mental health. In the next six years, 1.5 billion people will be 60 and older and 400 million of those will be 80 and older. So the world is aging. Some of the risk factors for developing mental health conditions as we age are loneliness and social isolation. Some older adults experience elder abuse, which also leads to mental health complications. The most common mental health disorder in seniors is depression and anxiety, and sometimes you can have both at the same time. Some of the risk factors for developing a mental health condition are what you see here. Sense of lack of purpose is a huge one that is going to come up in another slide. Elder abuse, substance use, chronic health conditions, and then lack of access to resources is also a big one. Here are some symptoms of depression in seniors, but it also could be symptoms for any adult. However, with seniors, you might also experience vague complaints if you're part of the medical community, there might be seniors that call 911 or go to the ER often for just vague complaints that are not a known or developing health issue. And then despite these symptoms, some seniors don't actually feel low or sad at all, but rather they might complain of low motivation and lack of energy. Here are some symptoms of anxiety. And again, you can have depression, anxiety at the same time. A lot of seniors might have excessive worry or fear. They could fear falling, having lack of resources, uh, the reduced income that they have when they retire. They could fear death as they get older. And remember that any of these symptoms can be worsened if you include substance misuse. According to the CDC in 2022, those aged 85 and older had the highest rates of suicide. Those aged 75 to 84 had the second highest rates of suicide. Here are some warning signs of suicide. If you have a loved one that you're concerned is experiencing any of these signs of suicide, it's important to be blunt. I know that we're all programmed to kind of sugarcoat things, but when it comes to suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts, it's important to be blunt. So ask the question, do you feel suicidal? Do you want to kill yourself? Do you have a plan to kill yourself? Be direct and to the point. And then if they say yes, call 911. Another sign not on here is, is someone who all of a sudden has an elevated mood. So maybe your loved one has been feeling depressed or low or moody for a few weeks and that's kind of their normal. And then out of the blue, they just feel really happy-go-lucky and they're full of energy. This could be a sign that they have a plan to commit suicide. So make sure you talk to them. 
Here's some of the impacts of having a mental health disorder that goes untreated. It can affect your health conditions. You could, again, same thing with like health literacy. You can have more ER stays, more hospital bills, staying at the hospital longer. You can also have the risk of suicide, or you could have a risk of taking more medications. So what can we do as a society and as an individual to help this? Older adults often lack access to care and support due to reduced income, medical or mobility issues, lack of transportation, or lack of education about, say, new technology, like all of our Zooms and our telehealth, or everyone's using their cell phones nowadays for everything. Mental health conditions among older population go under-recognized and under-treated. Also, stigma plays a role in why some people don't get treatment for substance use or mental health. And then in the senior community, a lot of our older adults were raised and grew up with the mindset that they're independent and strong and don't need anybody to help them and that they're perfectly okay. That plays a role in not getting the treatment that they need. Like I said before, social connection really does play an important role in your mental health. So if you have a senior that is experiencing some mental health symptoms, get them to an outing. There's senior centers around here. Um, St. Mary's County has three senior centers. You can take them to our church group. And back when I said lack of sense of purpose, volunteering gives them that sense of purpose. So if they're able to get out and volunteer, this is a great idea. Any kind of mental stimulation or engagement helps with mental health symptoms. And then if you have a loved one who's say at an assisted living facility or bed bound or at a nursing home, try to visit them as often as possible. Bring them activities that they can do if they're able to do that. Any kind of social connection really does help. Older adults often lack access to care and support due to reduced income, medical or mobility issues, lack of transportation, or lack of education about new technology like our telehealth or how everyone uses their cell phone for everything nowadays. So what we can do as a society is to help reduce the financial insecurity in their income equality. We can try to give them accessible housing, provide transport for them, and provide some education about these new technologies. Not only do we need to take care of our seniors, but we need to take care of our caretakers. So you have home health aides, nurses, nursing home techs, any family member that's a caretaker. I promise you all of them have experienced burnout. Every single one of them has experienced burnout. And when our caretakers are experiencing burnout, they're not able to fully care for their loved ones like they want to be able to. So we need to take care of our caretakers and their mental health as well. Some things that we can do as individuals to help our mental health are the age old diet and exercise, right? So make sure you're being mindful of what you put in your body. Try to get around and have a walk every, every other day. Try to refrain from tobacco. And nobody likes to hear this, but the amount of sugar that you eat every day does have an effect on your mental health especially soda, try to reduce the alcohol that you consume, and again, try to refrain from those harmful substances. All right, now I'm gonna go over some of the behavioral health programs we have at the health department. We have four primary units. We have prevention and outreach, care coordination, harm reduction, and we have the health hub. We refer residents to the local behavioral health division to give them the resources they need for mental health and substance misuse and other recovery services. We try to apply for as many grants as possible so that we can better help the community. One part of prevention and outreach is our suicide coordination and prevention program. This is the RUOK program. We partner with the sheriff's office and anyone who has had a suicide attempt we reach out to them and their families to give them resources, especially to the families too, because the suicide attempt will affect your family. Another part of prevention and outreach is our smart medicine program. And I talked a little bit about that earlier. So smart medicine focuses on the proper use, safe storage and proper disposal of your medications. We have medication take back days throughout the year. And again, you can always come bring in your medications to the health department or the health hub anonymously. 
Our harm reduction program is a little bit controversial. What we do is we meet the clients where they're at in recovery. The harm reduction program reduces the spread of infectious diseases related to injectable drug misuse. We also like to inform the public and keep them safe. We offer a broad range of interventions to meet the client where they're at in recovery. We have a distribution of sterile needles. We can screen for HIV and other STDs. We link our clients to treatment, recovery, and community resources. Our Go Purple campaign is an effort to raise awareness about stigma and inaccuracies surrounding behavioral health conditions and substance misuse. We can fight stigma by changing our language. Instead of junkie or addict, say a person with a substance use disorder. So you're putting the person before the diagnosis. We have had two successful Go Purple walks that happened in September, so one is upcoming in September, that promote the reduction of stigma and support those in recovery. Another program that the Behavioral Health Division has is the Hub and Spoke program. Typically, clients go to a hub or an Outlook clinic to be prescribed buprenorphine, methadone, and suboxone. Again, we're meeting the client where they're at in recovery. We encourage clients to seek a primary care physician for longer prescriptions. And we also encourage primary care physicians to be providers. The Hub and Spoke program offers many different resources to our clients. We can help you with therapy, provide transportation to safe spaces. We try to get you to safe housing and our peer support specialists can meet you where you are in your recovery and give you that additional support. Our care coordination program links individuals and families to different support services for mental health, substance use, housing, any kind of wraparound services that the individual or family needs. These are the following care coordination services that we offer. We have child, adolescent, and young adult. We have adult care coordination, older adult care coordination, which is me, suicide prevention and outreach, state care coordination, SOAR helps people get access to their benefits or apply for benefits. And then soon, hopefully, we're gonna have a PATH care coordinator, which helps individuals who are incarcerated and ready to be discharged but homeless find housing. And we have our Health Hub. I believe we just had our first annual anniversary for the Health Hub. It's located next to the Sheriff's Office and Church of Ascension in Great Mills, and it's where the old PNC Bank used to be. The Health Hub offers crisis support services. We have Spanish interpreters. We can do some primary care services, COVID testing and vaccines, and then they also are in charge of our school-based health programs in the community. And as promised, here are some resources. Here are the resources for anyone experiencing some substance misuse. Here are some mental health resources in the community. The mobile crisis response team is no longer and we are looking for another provider for that kind of service. The crisis warm line is for those who are not experiencing a mental health emergency. So just a mental health or a substance misuse crisis. You can call the warm line, you're not gonna be directed to 911 and you can help get the services that you need. Something that you might not know is something called Healthy St. Mary's Partnership. This is an organization that different organizations in the community and community partners and people like yourselves can be a part of. We have four different divisions. We have behavioral health, chronic disease, violence and trauma, and environmental health. And together, we try to help the community of St. Mary's with all of their needs. If you're interested, go ahead and sign up. It is free. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned a little bit about substance misuse and mental health for seniors. If you would like any more information, you can visit us at smchd.org. Thank you.